If we look at what we find in the world, elements, water, at the extreme level, consciousness, all of these things are, are made of more fundamental things. And yet, if you look at the properties of those fundamental things, there seems no possible way to combine those to yield th these emergent kinds of characteristics. Why do you say that? I mean, that's defeatism, isn't it, when you say, why, why, there seems to be no way. That's the whole point of we, we scientists are trying to, we're not, we're, although we might be reductionists and sort of stripping away matter down to its fundamentals, we're actually assemblists. <laughs> we really do try to go in the opposite direction to understand, to, to understand how, you know, properties can emerge from the simpler entities. Well, if today you had every characteristic of hydrogen gas in one set of books and oxygen gas in another set of books, would you be able to even begin to describe the properties of ice? Yeah, you bet I would. And water. <laughs> yeah, that the most amazing stuff. I, 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 uh, it is terribly difficult, and obviously hindsight comes into it. <laughs> That's the problem. How do you d detach um, sort of prediction from from hindsight? <laughs> and, and That's I, okay. That's and, fair. And, and I, I, I know what you know, water does, <laughs> basically. So uh, I've got a clue. But to reverse I, engineering, yeah, but that's fine. Yeah, I can, I can reverse engineer water, and I can, I think, reverse. Well, let's take a property of water, wetness. I mean, this is, people say, okay, hydrogen, oxygen, why can a, something that comes from right. them be wet? Right. And there's a, a paradigm Good. emergence problem. First of all, I can, I know that from the properties of hydrogen and oxygen that they will form molecules H2O. Okay. So I can get that far from the properties of these things. I know the shape of the water molecule. Sort of angular shape, that sort of thing. Um, I know the, I can calculate the electron distribution in that molecule. And I know that that molecule has got little patches of negative electric charge and little patches of positive electric charge. So I know that they're going to clump together. And since they're going to clump together, I know that they're going to form a condensed phase, be it a solid, ice, or liquid water. And um, so I'm beginning to see that you know, liquids and solids will emerge. From where those charges are distributed over the molecule, I know what the structure of ice will be. I know that it's going to be a kind of elaborate scaffolding, but I can predict that. Mm. No problem. Mm. Um, wetness of the water. Well, these little patches are that really is like um, scouts that go out blazing a trail, really. They can sort of wriggle around and find another, a positive patch can find a negative patch and so on, move towards it and so on. So I think that water can spread across the appropriate surface. Now, if it's a non-stick frying pan that you poured your water into, it's not going to find those little patches. So it's going to bunch up into, into little spheres. They're not going to be round spherical spheres. They're going to be squashed a bit because of gravity. So I think I can predict quite a lot of the properties of, of water. Now, will the same methodology be able to be applied to more complicated uh, elements? Yeah, of course it gets more difficult. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, but over time, can the same principle used to describe el characters of elements or larger uh, uh, molecules like biological molecules. Yeah. Can, can you can can you be able to in in a uh, a reductionist sense to explain the properties of new um, uh, levels based on the properties of the constituent parts? Yes, I think so. Um, um, I'm not claiming that I, I personally sure, sure. can, but I, I see no problem in principle with it. I see no real problem with, um, for example, the structure of DNA, I mean, which follows almost logically from the, from the structure of the nucleic acids itself. And once you've got to that point, you can begin to understand that it's an encoding device for inheritance. I think, um, you can probably predict, and this is really the at the heart of much biochemical research at the moment, the, 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 the structure of a protein. 
And once you've got the structure, because in biology, um, function is effectively synonymous with structure. Sure. If you know structure, then you've got a pretty good idea right. about what it's going right. to do. Um, then I think you could make a good stab at, in due course, we can't predict protein structures yet. It's but fiendishly once, complicated. Fiendishly complicated, and, uh, but not, you know, the, the, the fiend is not going to defeat us. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there. I mean, that's the whole point about science is this driving optimism that it has. You don't go into science if you think you won't find the answers. You go into science because you think you will find the answers. Um, and I, I suppose if you go up the scale that you're obviously hinting at, and you really mentioned the question of consciousness and so on, that supreme emergent property, that most mysterious property of all, um, is there any hope that knowing the structure of the periodic table, we could account for you know, the fact that we're having this conversation? Sure. Or at least I think we're having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see why not. I mean, it's obviously neuroscience is still in its infancy. Um, it's, it demands a congruence of so many different kinds of science. Uh, you, and effectively, you require maturity in the sciences that you bring to bear on it. It requires maturity of chemistry, of biochemistry, biology, anatomy, uh, neurophysiology, and increasingly, of course, um, computation. Uh, and it's that congruence of mature sciences which will help us to understand the 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 the, 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 the mechanism of consciousness. There's nothing intrinsically mysterious about consciousness. It's just a very difficult and fascinating property. I struggle with this idea that there are different levels uh, in the organization of reality where the kinds of explanations that we use at some atomic level, at uh, atomic level, molecular level, you get the biological systems and, as you've said, consciousness, seem to be different. But if we can begin to explain those uh, uh, jumps, then it may be much more of a continuum that appears to us today. How, yeah. how do we think about that? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure it is a continuum. I don't believe in that nature has different jumps and, and so on, different levels of different types of explanation. Well, I suppose that's not right, really. I think it does have different types of explanation, but they're, they're, they show um, an evolutionary sequence, really. And we wouldn't dream of bringing sociology to bear on the structure of the atom. <laughs> but but um, I think in the opposite direction, we could bring the structure of the atom to bear on, on sociology. So there, there, is, <laughs> there, is, there is a hierarchy um, but you, um, but it only goes one direction. Yeah, it only goes in, in, in. I think it's true to say it goes only in one direction. Yeah, you need to think about that actually. Yeah. I'm sure, there's exceptions to that. Um, but I think the point to remember is that you know, science is still very young, and we're still learning, and we're assembling. We're cautious revolutionaries, basically. That we're we're assembling our forces by stealth, you could mm -hmm. almost say, mm -hmm. that we're learning, we're doing our scales, <laughs> you know, five-finger exercises yeah. and so on. At some point, we've got to bring our five-finger exercises together to mm -hmm. get a tune, and then we've got to get a tune, and then we've got to orchestrate it to get a symphony and, and so on. And I think we're moving towards that. I mean, it's, I can't repeat uh, enough, I think, that science is an optimistic pursuit. Mm. And as soon as you start saying, we'll never explain that, you're no longer a scientist, in my view. I think you become a philosopher then. <laughs> you seem to say that <laughs> in a very derogatory way. <laughs> yeah, but uh, maybe I have the greatest respect for philosophy, so long as it doesn't interfere with our progress. <laughs> but I think, you know, when you look at the emergence of consciousness, which is, you know, the, the, um, the, the extreme example of emergence, really. How are we going to understand it? And I, I, it's going to be 
taking up your point, really, a completely different type of understanding from the origin of the universe. I think the origin of the universe we will understand in terms of a mathematical formula, uh, which will take decades, maybe, to identify and probably centuries to pursue its ramifications. But um, to, to understand the complex system of the brain and its property of the, the way that it generates consciousness, then we have to sort of use, um, we have to simulate it, I believe. It won't be the same kind of explanation. Once we have simulated consciousness by on some kind of computer, not necessarily a digital computer, but you know, who knows what sort of computer. But once we have simulated it, then we'll be able to poke around inside and start to understand it. We can't really look into people's heads very effectively at the moment because that kills them. And you know, the scientists still draw the line <laughs> at destructive testing. But you have no doubt that consciousness in its full, robust, strong definition can be simulated on a computer. Um, I have no doubt that a consciousness can be. Of course, it will take perhaps a thousand years to decide whether it's the same consciousness sure. as we have, and that would be fascinating. Yeah, time being no no limit, no limit of time. No, no. Well, I, then I, I, I don't see why we can't gradually refine a, um, a, a, a PC gradually <laughs> you know, towards a, a conscious entity in due course. I'm fascinated with what you said about the uh, levels of explanation going from bottom up, which we feel comfortable we can do. And then the question, is it ever possible that a higher level can affect a lower level? In your mechanism, it's hard to see how that can happen. Yes, because in a sense that would almost teleological, wouldn't it? Yeah. And I... And, and I I, I don't believe in teleology or anything like that. That the ends that can the, produce can, the... Can influence, yeah. So yeah. if we're talking about emerge, I can't believe, for example, that the wetness of water can have any influence yes. upon the structure right. of the molecule. Right. And so just as um, you know, a conscious entity really can't have an influence on the structure of its own atoms. So I think it probably is unidirectional. Although, you know, I'm thinking, trying to think furiously of counterexamples. <laughs> well, I mean, look, that's what science is. Yeah. It, it, it's having a conviction oh, that you something... Have it in, okay, in sociology you have it, where um, you know, a group can influence an individual. Ah. Yeah. Uh, 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 but in neither one of those are you, are you dealing with physical entities in a sense. You're well, why not? I mean, a group is a physical entity. And just as a, you know, a glass of water is a mm. physical entity. And the, and the individual is the atom of that glass of water, basically. I think it's an analogy, but I, I don't think it's the same thing. Um, but, but that's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>